Well, good morning. Yes, so this is the title, Using the Fiery Sword of Lean with Agile Thinking to Turbocharge Service Management. And when we were coming up with the title, they said, think of something catchy, but also relevant. So this is what we wound up with. So, so one, the title's fun. What's also going to be fun is you're going to get to see the silhouette of a bald head as I walk back and forth. So I will try not to walk here too much to distract you. So agenda, objectives, why are we all here? First thing I want to do is really tell you the story of Lean at American Fidelity. And we call it our journey because it really doesn't have an end, but it's always about continuous improvement. But through that story, I want you to develop a practical understanding of Lean in IT. We hear, oh, here's Lean, here's Lean. But how do I use it, right? How can I do this? Um, understand how all these buzzwords we hear, Lean, Kanban, KCS, Agile how all of these start to intersect into this really cool thing that helps us improve service management. It's really fascinating when it comes together. With any story, you always have good, hey, here are the roadblocks and pitfalls, here are the things to avoid. We've walked through it, we weren't perfect, but we found out that that hurts. (laughs) And also that you can walk away um, with an approach to turbocharge your teams for continuous improvement with Lean. So you can walk out of here and go, okay, I've got an idea how I could approach this. Fair enough. So first off, I'm Jonathan Hinkle. I've been with American Fidelity for eight, nine years. Uh, Been in IT for a while. But let me tell you about a little bit about our company because this is relevant. So American Fidelity was founded in 1960. Uh, So one thing to notice is that's a while and it's an insurance firm. So change can be slow sometimes, right? Sometimes it doesn't hit us quickly. But what we do is we sell products that that cover where major medical misses, so like life, cancer, uh, things like that. The bottom line, we want to protect people's income. And so how this starts to feed back into IT, it's really cool to be part of an organization where in IT, I help an organization make promises to people and then keep those promises. And we always have in the back of our mind, when someone calls us, And when we support anyone inside our organization, we know somewhere down the line is someone who's probably had a bad day. Because when they have to use our services, look at life, cancer. They just found out they had cancer. They lost a spouse. So we always keep that in our mind that what we do matters because we help protect people when bad things happen. Um, About 2,000 colleagues serving more than 1 million customers. Really enjoy it. It's a fun place to work. So, let's start the journey. A lot happened for me in 2011. My son was born, Levi. He's, he's six now. He's hilarious. I have five now, almost six. Um, I also have a daughter, so I'm not leaving her out, but it doesn't fit in the timeline. She's also fun, too. She's seven. Um, I read the book, The Goal, by Eliyahu Goldratt. This was really fascinating to me. I had not really been... Um, doing a lot of management stuff. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. I read The New Rational Manager by Kepner Trago. And also I accepted a support center manager position at American Fidelity. This is the help desk position. So before I go into that, let me tell you a little story about Levi. This is what makes him so funny. So last summer, we went to Branson, Missouri, my wife and, and the two kids, right? Completely what you would expect. In the car, full trip. It was a fun time. But we went to Silver Dollar City. Silver Dollar City has roller coasters, and there's one called the Powder Keg, which which its name alone could sound intimidating, but to a five-year-old, it sounded awesome. And so he said, Dad, I want to ride this. I want to ride this. I want to ride this. I said, awesome. Let's go get in line. Line wasn't too long, but long enough for me to hear, Dad, I want to ride this. Dad, I want to ride this. Dad, I want to ride this. So we get in. I sit down. And these are the straps. You know, they aren't the lap right here that, that goes down your waist. They go over. And so click, 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 click. And then I hear Levi, not to me, but just a statement. I don't want to ride. (laughs) And I laughed, right? Nothing we could do. You're on on this roller coaster. Well, (laughs) I laughed because I know how that feels. (laughs) Because after I accepted the support center manager position, I said, I don't want to (laughs) ride. We've got a lot of problems. And memes have the power to communicate things so effectively these days. So two memes came to my mind, and for reasons you'll understand, I left off the words, but my first reaction was this. 
My second reaction was this. I said, we have a problem here. How bad was it? So I stepped in, and we were known as the helpless desk. Have anybody heard that before? Has anybody said that before? (laughs) Right, we were known as the helpless desk, not respected, and frankly, with very good reason. Not because we didn't have good people wanting to do good things. This is where we were. So I highlighted a few of these. You know, each agent had over 100 tickets assigned to them and growing. I got a lot of calls from angry people. Now, I'm from Oklahoma. America Fidelity is Oklahoma based. We're kind people. We say bless their hearts. So when you get a call from someone that's angry, you know someone's really angry, right? So Because normally we're pretty nice about it. But tickets were flying out from everywhere. I mean, I'd turn a chair over and five more tickets would just poof, fly out. Like, my goodness, they're, they're multiplying. So I did what any reasonable person would do in this situation. I cried. Okay, then after I overcame that, I said, okay, I'm on this roller coaster. I'm locked in. I'm not getting out. I need to look for help. What are people doing? And this truly began my realization because I had been a technical guy and managing and process is totally different from just knowing how to make a server server, right? (laughs) So I looked for help. I discovered ITIL. I was so desperate, I bought the books and read them in from it. All seven of them. And if you want to fall asleep, go buy the books and read them in to end. It's very dry. A lot of good stuff, but very dry. I also joined an organization called HDI. Um, it did stand for the Help Desk Institute. They've now called it just HDI. And this really helps support centers. How do you do things? And so I started going to every group I could, you know, all their conferences, just to understand what's going on here. And then I discovered, well, I mean, I didn't find it. I learned about it, Lean. And we called it the fiery sword. So, so why did we call that that? In our organization, we have a group outside of IT called Strategic Quality Management, which sounds very official. But Lean started to grow from that group. Little did I know, a couple years before, our president had said, we are going to be a lean organization. We're going to do things lean. So they had a group, and this is what they gave them the power to do. It was very new, and it hadn't really started out into IT. But someone in that group came to me and said, Jonathan, you need to go to this. You need to learn about this. And I was desperate. I said, okay, whatever. But we noticed that whenever Lean got involved, and we called them Lean Initiatives or Kaizen events, things happened. And we joked and said it was like someone walked in with a fiery sword and started swinging it around. Or people, I don't want to do that. Oh, I got Lean. Never mind, I'll do it. I mean, that was kind of the reaction we were seeing. So, okay, well, what is this thing? And does it apply to IT? So let me give you kind of the overview of Lean, where it came from. Really, it's lean factoring. That's where it grew out of. But the thing I like about it is it grew on the shoulder of giants. Somebody had some breakthrough here. Someone else stepped on that slowly and slowly. Now, Eli Whitley, if you're from Oklahoma, you know him for one thing. Anybody know what that is? Cotton gin, right? Right? He also is known for something else, which today sounds obvious, but the theory of interchangeable parts. The idea that if I build two machines that are identical, I can take a part from this one and put it in that one, and it will work. That, at its time, was groundbreaking, and he did, he did it with his, with his uh, uh, cotton gins. So you hit this age where we're t- starting to build stuff. And previously, things had been built by, by people, by specialists, by craftsmen, right? Well, they started to gather craftsmen together. Do you remember the first thing that was really kind of mass-produced? Guns, right? But even then, if you go look at an antique gun that was created, they're slightly different. Because each craftsman, they just put him in a room, had his own unique custom way to do it. And you could not take a part from one and put it into another one. And so they said, hey, we've got to do some stuff. So, boom, Industrial Revolution, all this stuff starts happening. We've got to figure out how to do this better. Um, We hit all these really cool ideas with standardized work and time studies, but we know Ford, right? That's that's when we're like, oh yeah, Ford, the assembly line. Now, he didn't invent it, but he really mastered it. 
And even back then, Ford understood the longer you have something in your factory, the more it costs you. So he was so focused on getting things out fast. Bring it in, manufacture it, get it out. Bring it in, manufacture it, get it out. So, and what was Ford's favorite saying about the Model T, about the color? Any color you want as long as it's black. Do you know why it's black? Had a lot of black paint. No, but good answer. Because black dries the fastest. He even then understood, oh, well, let's do black. It dries the fastest. On. So this was his concept. Well, World War II happened, and Japan is trying to rebuild. And they said, hey, America, can you send someone over to help us? And we said, take dimming. Now, dimming, we view as, man, this guy was smart. But back then, he annoyed a lot of people in manufacturing. Annoyed a lot. Because he said, you should be doing it this way. So when they said, who should we send? The manufacturer said, send this guy, because we don't want to deal with him. So he went over there, and then the story of the Toyota production system, Taichi Ono. If you've read the book Lean Manufacturing, they call him the greatest Muda hunter that history's ever produced. Total quality management, all of this started to be called lean, right? And lean doesn't stand for anything. It was coined um, as a lean, mean, money-making machine, and they just shortened it to lean. So there's no magic in it. That's, that's really what it means, just lean. So you take this, and I wanted to show this because you get kind of a perspective that this is an ever-changing and ever-improving process. That's what lean's about, but it also has some deep, deep history that has a lot to teach us. So what is the actual definition of lean? Now, this is kind of uh, meaty, but they all mean something. So a systematic approach to identify and eliminate waste, non-value added activity, through continuous improvement at the pull of the customer in pursuit of perfection. We had to memorize that at work. Right, because we wanted it to be that much of a, this is what it's about. But it's systematic. This doesn't mean it's a framework. This means this is prescriptive. This is how you go about doing it, which I love. Right? We love ideas, but, I mean, give me the three steps that I should do. So this is what it does. But non-value-added activity. Lean applies to IT because IT manufactures solutions. Think about what you do. You keep a service running. That's a solution. When we were getting calls at the helpless desk, air quotes, um, we were manufacturing the solution. We were manufacturing the request. So we could take some of these principles. But there was a study in 97 by NIST that found that there is 95% of process lead time is non-value added activity. 95%, 95%, and you say, well, Jonathan, you have 98%. That's because in 2003, a PhD student said that was done on manufacturing. I'm going to look at transactional process world akin to IT world. And it was worse, 98% of process lead time. That means in any process you're doing, there is potentially 98% of stuff that is non-value added. Huh. So I saw that and was like, well, that certainly feels right in my area. So let's define these two types of activity. Value add, it it makes sense. Anything that increases the market form, the function, the product or service. Something that someone is willing to pay for. Okay? Well, what's non-value add activity? (laughs) Anything else? Pretty much anything else. Now, you need... Process, labors, materials, space, equipment, but anything beyond the minimum you need it is waste. But this does beg the question, who is your customer? Now, this was a mind shift for me. I went into the help desk, and I said, my customer is, in, customer is anybody that calls me. We are an internal help desk, right? So we would service our fellow colleagues. I said, that's, that's my customer. That's my customer, and I could not have been more wrong. And I'll tell you why. Because our organization kind of went on this journey of defining who our customer is. And what had happened, if I were to demo with two chairs here, so you had one chair right here, 
and another chair right here facing opposite of each other. When we said that you're my customer, I simply sat in this chair. And the business sat in that chair. And this relationship right here is very one-sided and almost necessitates a win-lose. Because they may say, I want X, Y, Z. And as IT, we say, you bet you are our customer. We shall fulfill what you're asking. And what it created was Frankensteins of IT systems to manage. And we did a lot of navel gazing. Because if my customer is internal, who am I looking at? Internal. Who's really my customer? The one who pays us money. The ones who we make promises to and the ones who we keep promises to. That's our customer. That turned my mind. I was like, oh, crud. I've been going about this the wrong way. It also gave us a lot more power because when a special VP demanded something done just for them, you could say, but is this really value to the customer? It was very good. So our organization went through that and said, and defined top to bottom, our customer is the one who pays us money, the employer and their employee. That's, that's who our customer is. Well, when you look at things through that lens, it changes stuff. So lean talks about waste. We hear non-value activity, activity. There are eight wastes of lean. And I love acronyms because it spells downtime. Great way to remember it, downtime. And these are going to be common sense. Defect, something's broken, doesn't come out the way it should. Something's wrong. Overproduction, producing more of one thing than the next step can take at a time. I, the greatest example we had of those are... are uh, promotional material for 20, I think 2002, we found a whole stack. They produced this many, but it was never consumed by the next line, so they just sat there. Waiting. We saw that in check-in a couple days ago, right? It's when you wait for anything, anything in the process. Waiting is a waste. Not utilizing people. Like I said, I'm from Oklahoma. Sometimes we feel our state flag should be construction. It just waves in the wind. They're always doing construction. And when you drive by a construction route, invariably, and maybe it's just us, you'll see the guy working and the 10 others watching. <laughs> and you're like, are they utilizing people? Their thoughts, their creativity. Travel. This is any time you walk to go do something. How many times do you walk to go to the printer, walk back to sit, sit back at your desk, walk to go somewhere? You're traveling. Inventory. Anything in excess of what you need to meet demand is waste because money is tied up in inventory. Those 2002 brochures, we threw them away in 2013. <laughs> and there was a lot of them. So that was a wasted inventory. Motion. Do you ever get like a stack of papers that are stapled and you have to unstaple them and then you're done and you sit them down the line only for someone else to staple them and then it goes down the line and somebody shuffles them? That's that idea of motion, that this, this thing you're doing that doesn't add value. And finally, excess processing. Oh, change management. <laughs> Right? I already got an approval here, 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 and here. Why do I need another pro approval in triplicate? It's anything that's excess to the process that is unnecessary. Now, if I can sign off here, why do I need my manager to sign off here and sign off here, sign off here? Right? So, so far, pretty bleak. <laughs> right? Um, this is the situation I found in. I started to discover lean, and lean said, hey, there's such a thing as defects and waste and all this stuff. And I said, yes, there is, but what do I do about it? Fortunately, there's a toolbox for that, and these are called lean tools. Now, some like to view this as a house. I like to look at it as a little box, and you walk into the box using this value stream mapping, little steps, and you can reach in and use these tools as needed. Value stream mapping is the steps because it's so important. Value stream mapping maps the entire process, end to end, left to right of what it takes to produce the value the customer is asking. The value the customer is asking. Not what you think they want, but what they want. And you get a great view of what's going on. And then you're able to apply these tools. I'm not going to go through each one of them. I'll talk about how we did a lean and what we used. You can apply these tools, pull them out of the toolbox, and extract that waste from a process. So this, you're just dragging it out. So this is how we conducted a lean event.
This is kind of brass tacks, what we did. So our lean events took five days on average. We would assign five days. There were different roles. We had a champion. The champion was the guy or gal responsible for kicking down the doors and slashing the tires. Well, okay, not that far, but they removed roadblocks and obstacles. That was their job. If you run encounter something political, and oh my goodness, you will, they said, hey, get over it. Let's move on. The process owner is, is like the process owner we hear today. They're the ones responsible for the process. So they would be involved in this lean event. And then you would have the lean team. So the team are people in the value stream. They would come together five to seven. You don't want a big team, five to seven. Odd numbers so you can do tie breaks. And you empower this team to find the solution. And that is a huge component of this. You can't just say, hey, go do this lean and come back with these results. You have to be willing to let it go. Once again, I thought of my daughter and let it go. Anyway, sorry, now that song is in your head. You have to let it go and empower them to do it. So we have the champion, the process owner. We would map the value stream. Let me show you what a value stream before lean for us looked like. It's pretty, right? <laughs> so this, once again, left to right. It was so complicated, we had to start color coding things to determine where things belonged. Every one of those lines you see with the little jaggy lightning bolt meant a line of communication. And then things would move from left to right. Very, very complicated. So you map that. Then you get the, the room, the, the group in a room, and you go over what you call a charter. A charter simply defines what you're going after. This is key because the charter defines your scope. If you're not careful, these leans will just spread out. And a scope is from the time this happens to the time that. For example, from the time we hire a new employee to the time they're ready to work. That could be a scope. And you're going to lean that entire value stream. We form the team. We do a lean 101, kind of like what we're doing here. This is what lean is. These are the tools. This is waste. This is what you can do. And then you review the current state map. And then the fun begins. Because <laughs> you'll see down there we go into pain storming. Now this is, there's a lot of techniques for this, but you're basically capturing from the value stream, what are the pains you have with this? And then they'll even go out and ask people in the organization. And you start to write them down. Now normally what we've seen, we, we use those big sticky pad, you know, we stick them on the wall. Um, we used for, for the support center, our first lean, we used 20. I mean, we had like a ridiculous amount of pains to the point where the facilitator said, I've never seen so many. I said, you're welcome. But So a lot of pains. Now this is going over five days. So after you do the pain, you do the downtime exercise. This is where lean starts to come in. You start to say, this pain is what waste? Oh, I'm waiting. Oh, that's a defect. Sometimes you get Yahtzee and one's all of them. <laughs> and you start to assign that. Once you get that, you're able to say, here are the most painful and the most wasteful things we're dealing with. Top of line right here. Then you go into solutions. Okay, knowing our tools, knowing what we can do in Lean, how do we fix this? And how would we measure that? And finally, what would our future state map look like? This is the future state map of the one I just showed you. A little bit cleaner, a little bit easier to follow. Yes, we reduced a lot of waste. This was a process that was prone with excess processing because we got approvals through things 10 different ways. So they say, this is what we can be. This is what we can be. You, you pick the lean tools you're using, and then you just start, you do it as far as an action plan. Say, all right, you go do this. You go do this. You go do this. And it's all about... The reason it's called Kaizen, it's that good, quick change, evolutionary change, not a big bang, but we're, we're slowly making progress. So you put the team through this five-day event, and we do it in one room. We intentionally leave everything up on the wall so people can walk by and go, wow, look at all this stuff. Because when you take people, employees away, their manager wonders, what are they doing? Which is why we would have daily debriefs for the stakeholders. Here's what we worked on today. Here's what we're going. And then finally, we'd have a celebration. And depending on the size of the event, it may be cupcakes or it may be going to, we have something called main event, which is like a, uh, 
gosh, I, I teased my team. I said, I don't want to call it adult entertainment because it's not like that. It's like a t- entertainment that people who are responsible adults would go do. Whatever that would be. <laughs> we call it main event, whatever there is around here. <laughs> so you celebrate. So that is how we did this. This is replicatable anywhere. This is how you run a lean event. Okay? So, I've given you a timeline. I don't want to ride. Here I am. This is what lean is. So then what happened? So this was the first support center lean we had. The guy on the left is terrified. Because I have no idea how this is going to turn out at all. I'm also lighter. I've gained some weight, whatever. Um, (laughs) The lady in the middle was the voice of our customer. She represented kind of our end user in the value stream. She did a great job. Everyone here did a great job. And we focused on from the time something enters the support center to the time it left, right? Just that little thing. What were our, these were the lean tools we used? 5S. 5S is is a great technique to come up and clean, clean up an area. A lot of time in manufacturing, you kind of go to an area and you clean it up. And it stands for sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. Like, okay, that's cool. Well, we had a ridiculous backlog of incidents. And so we used 5S to attack that. We made a team and we called it a code red. And yes, there were all the jokes you'd imagine. People were coming in with Mountain Dew code reds. People were asking me, did you order this code red? And I was saying, yes, you're darn right, I did. <laughs> right? And so it went through the same. And they went, they sorted them. They set them in order. They cleaned up a lot. They set them in order. This should be in this classification, this classification. Boy, they shined. And that means they went and resolved everything they could. Then they standardized the way we would do it. And then so that it could be sustained. So standardized work. I'll I'll save you guys a lot of time. When you are first looking at doing a lean initiative, ask two questions. One, do you have standardized work? By standardized work, I mean you have a consistent way of doing something repeatedly that anybody can see. And some most will say no. Some will say, yes, we do. You say, great, show it to me. Now, if they walk over to a shelf, pull out this three-ring binder, and they go dust it off, say, so here it is, and a new employee goes, what's that? They do not have standardized work. So this is what we did. We standardized how we did things. We made a playbook that we called it. Quality at the source is the idea that you do not pass something on until it is an acceptable level of quality. Now, I'm ta- talking about spending 30 minutes to make sure. It's a quick visual check that you can do. You can look at the incident and say, I have a summary. The description contains these elements. That's of quality. I will pass it on. Rather than just getting it and throwing it down the line. Visual controls, I'll hop down here. This was a way you can see what's going on visually very quickly. We made dashboards where it was red, yellow, green. We're doing good. We're doing bad. And finally, a pull system. Now, this, this one scared me to death. Let me tell you how I was assigning tickets. <laughs> I was an idiot. First, I'll say, I'll say that. So this is how I was doing it. Uh, tickets would come in. I'd say, you get a ticket, and you get a ticket, and you get a ticket, and you get... I was Oprah. Everybody gets a ticket, right? This is how I was assigning them. And I started to notice that some people were keeping up, others weren't. So I had a bright idea. I'll assign the next ticket to whoever has the least amount of items in their queue. What's your name? Wendell. Wendell. Hey, Wendell, great job cleaning up all your tickets. 30 more, <laughs> right? Amazingly, everybody started, you know, right? <laughs> Human behavior, it's funny, right? I was an idiot. A pull system says rather than me trying to push these tickets to people, you allow the analyst to go pull it when they're ready. That scared me to death because I said, ah, oh, <laughs> they're not going to work. You know, are they going to do this? What I found is most people genuinely want to do a good job. Really, most people do. We did have some situations we had to deal with, but by and large, they want to. We also had performance measurements to balance that so that we would say, instead of the activity, hey, how many tickets did you open? We would ask, how many tickets did you resolve? Instead of saying, and then we started looking at how long it took to resolve. So we kind of had this balance so that someone wouldn't like cherry pick and get all these. 
But with the pull system, we made a button where they could press and it would just assign them the next ticket blindly. Okay? So how did it, how did it work? So these were our results initially. Um, but we were pretty pleased with this. You know, active assigned incidents were reduced to about 15 per analyst. Team cohesion really improved, right? Nobody was out just for them. It was all of a sudden, hey, we're on the same team. We don't have to be the helpless desk. We decided to rename ourselves to the support center because we just couldn't shake help desk, and it's an old term anyway. And our average speed answer was 20 minutes, which is horrible. But keep in mind, we did not answer the phone. We let everything go to voicemail. So compared to infinity, that's a pretty darn good percentage improvement. <laughs> So we saw some improvements, and that began 2012, what I called the year of lean sieges. We said, this worked, let's go lean everything. So we said, let's lean the subject matter experts. So when the support center hands it off, let's go lean what they do. Let's go lean uh, how people request changes. Let's go lean how we do mainframe stuff. We still have a mainframe. Yo, let's go lean how we onboard people. Just temps, just temps. We're getting some, some success, but something was missing. And I couldn't put my finger on it. Now, people recognize this picture here. Okay, a few. All right, yeah. What, what's this from? What game is this from? Age of Empires, right? You know, this real-time strategy game. It's really fun. I'm a nerd. I still play it. Um, but you build these castles, and you build these walls, and your objective is to take the castle. But I felt like we were attacking the walls, nipping at these edges when I really wanted to get the castle. And I could not understand what was happening. I said, we're getting a lot of progress, but it's just not getting to where I want to go. Well, in 2013, someone handed me a book and said, you should read this. And I think I have a sign that says, please give Jonathan something to read because he's helpless, because that happens so much to me. You should read this. You should read this. So I got a book called The Phoenix Project. In February of 2013, I think it actually came out in, in January. And a developer came to me and go, Hinkle, you should read this. And The Phoenix Project is a novel, just kind of about a situation that Bill, an IT operations manager, had to go through with projects. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's like they took a little camera and followed our organization around. Who's read this book? Awesome. If you haven't read the book, go read it right now. Well, read it after this session. Okay. It's really, really cool, and it totally changed the way I thought about things. And it has kind of these, they called them the three ways. One, systems thinking, we call that the principle of flow. Feedback, the principle of feedback. And then finally, experimentation, right? Continuous improvement, trying things. And I go, wait, this, this book sounds familiar. And then I remembered something I'd read in 2011, the goal, because the Phoenix Project was patterned after the goal on purpose. And in the goal, Goldratt says something profound. Any improvements made anywhere besides the bottleneck are an illusion. Not that they don't bring value, but they're not going after what you want. And I realized, holy cow, systems thinking. So in 2013, I did this. I took a deep breath. I said, I need to dig deeper into this concept. So I dug deeper into the Phoenix Project and where it came from and all the stuff that made it. We were implementing a new IT service management tool. We were also training everybody on these different processes, incident problem, change, request, knowledge. I also then became responsible for all those. So I'm like, oh my gosh, my world is changing. I need to just breathe. And I really, really, really kept coming back to the thought of this systems thinking. Systems thinking, flow, value stream. Am I seeing the entire value stream? And what I was doing was this. I was in a boat, one end, and there was a hole in the other end. And I was sitting at the top end going, sure glad the hole's not on our end, but we're all in the same boat. When I leaned the support center, I leaned the support center part, not the subject matter experts. And we got good, and they weren't so good. And I said, <laughs> we're awesome. I'm glad we're not thinking. Oh, we are. 
So he said, we got to change this. We've got systems thinking problem. we got to view this bigger. So in 2014, we said, let's cut this out. Let's start looking at the grand scope of things. Let's look at flow, the entire value stream. So we had three lean initiatives. Incident management. Not just how to support incident management end to end. Change management end to end. Not just how you request them. And onboarding new people. Not just temps. Everybody. Now, I'm happy to say, and this is a complete side note with um, onboarding new colleagues, when people started with us, it used to take weeks for them to get a laptop. I don't know. Maybe this is a familiar experience with some people. I'm happy to say now, because of this lean and the efforts of some really good people, they get their laptop the day they start within four hours. And it's really, really cool to see that kind of stuff come out. We have people that start with us go, oh, my laptop's here? Yes, it is. Let me tell you about Lean. So we went back and we said, okay, 2014, filling fill in my roots, oats, saying, okay, we've done some stuff. I've been at this a couple years. I bet we're pretty awesome. But how are we doing compared to everyone else in the industry? So MetricNet is an organization that will benchmark you. They ask for a ton of data from you, and they go compare you apples to apples. So we're an internal support group. You know, we deal with these type of things and this type of stuff. And then they'll benchmark you with your peers. And I said, okay, we've got to be pretty awesome. We're pretty average, <laughs> right? And I was like, are you kidding me? All this effort we put in and we're just average? I mean, I know everybody thinks they're above average and we thought we were above average, but we were just average. Part of my team said, well, at least we're not below average. <laughs> I said, yes, but we're not above it. So that was kind of disappointing. I said, what in the world? Okay, we've, we've seen this systems thinking view. What are we missing? What is going on here? So in 2015, we wanted to bring the feedback back. Justin Timberlake should make this a song, right? We wanted to bring feedback back, and we did it through two ways. Now, first of all, feedback is simply knowing if the action you're taking is right or wrong. The feedback loop is how quickly you know, right? If my son were to touch a hot stove, he would very quickly know if that was the right or wrong thing to do. Now, because he's my son, he might do it again, but he would know. But why is it so hard to work out <laughs> and eat right? Because that feedback loop is forever long, right? Especially when you can eat a donut and you're like, everything's cool. <laughs> nope. So feedback loop, we wanted to tighten it. And the first way to do that was to get all of our work visible so you could see what we were doing. We first started out with paper, then we started using something called Trello, and we were just visualizing our work. The second thing is knowledge-centered support. Now, this, this is worthy of its own breakout session. This will change the way you do knowledge. It is truly applying lean to knowledge. But we went down this endeavor so we would know if what we're doing was the right thing so we could manage our knowledge. Still not enough traction. So we said, well, okay, when you get a fiery sort of lean out, why is it so effective? And we, as a team, we started breaking this down. We've got the flow. We've got a little bit of the feedback here, but why is it so effective? And we realized, ugh, we locked these people in a room for five days. And they are not allowed to do anything else but this lean. We focus their work and intentionally tell them to neglect everything else. We focus. And I was like, wait, this sounds familiar. This sounds familiar. This sounds like limiting work in progress. Limiting whip. Stay focused. Limit whip. So we took our, our boards where we were showing what we are doing, and we took the next step. And we use a tool called Lean Kit, and this is actually a picture from one of our teams. And they, the work flows left to right, and so you can see work move in, and in that middle column right there is what's in progress. Now, it was fascinating to watch because the team said, okay, well, we'll limit our work to 20. And they, they said, okay, well, maybe to 15. Okay, to 10. Okay, to 5. Now they're down to three. This is even before they got down to three, and they found they were to move, able to move much quicker with all these improvements they were wanting to do and with what their work, their job did. Okay? 
really powerful, started to focus them in. Things started to get done. The side benefit is team cohesion even improved even more. And we started to roll this out to all of my teams. People didn't say, oh, I got my task done. People were then asking, what do we need to do to get the task done? Right? Because if they could only get three into the whip, if they came to me and they said, hey, Jonathan, we need to pick up this thing, I'd say, no problem as soon as you finish one thing else. And so I empowered them to say no, and they're able to move stuff through much faster. It was really cool. Um, then we went again for, um, oh, excuse me. Whoop, my clicker went crazy. Going through this, I started, though, to hear a lot about Agile. Remember, I'm from infrastructure, infrastructure operations. So Agile was the thing that those developers did. And I, I love our developers. They're great. But I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. Well, when I started hitting onto these boards, I started to read a lot of blogs and a lot of content about Agile and Kanban boards. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe there's something here. And one day, someone said to me, hey, Jonathan, you need to look at this. And it was something called Certified Agile Service Management. I was like, whoa, whoa, what? Agile Service Management? What is this? And it was basically taking the principles of Agile, because Agile principles, and applying it to service management. But I realized you could apply this to operations. Visualizing this work, limiting things in progress, all this, all this cool stuff. So I started digging in that. And in 2016, early 2016, this is really what we started to dig in. To me, this really started to bring things full circle. Agile service management says this. We value the items on the left more than the items on the right. Okay, whoops. Process guy, just make sure everybody was awake. Process guy, I value process and tools. I think they're cool, right? It's how we get stuff done. It's awesome. Comprehensive documentation, I hate to write it, but I love it when someone else does. Contract negotiations, eh, I actually don't enjoy that, but I like knowing where you stand and what your commitment is. And following a plan. I, on my disk profile, I'm a DI. So I have people on my team who are really good about this part. I'm more like, hey, ho, this is where we're going. And then they go, hey, how are we going to get there? So following a plan is important. But Agile Service Management said, hey, think about this a little different. Individuals and interactions are valued over the process and the tools. And so we started saying something in our group. We value the purpose of the process over the process. We value the purpose of the process over the process. This did some interesting things. It made us stop and say, do we have too much process here? Have we over-engineered it? Because the concept that started flowing here is just like you have minimum viable product with Agile and Scrum, you have minimum viable process with Agile service management. Why did we need that? Oh, sounds like we're identifying waste and removing it from a process. Very lean. Um, working software. Well, we said we want it to work. Right? If people have to do all this stuff to get into change, then it's not working. And we measured working by when people went around the process. It would go, oh, you've got a controlled audience. They can't go around. Oh, yeah, they can. <laughs> oh, and yeah, they do. Customer collaboration. The two seats. You know, we didn't want to sit facing across from each other. We wanted to sit side by side. Let's work on this together. And finally, responding to change. But what it gave me... And what really excited us is it gave us a framework and a methodology to do something called Point Kaizen. So a lean event takes five days, normally. And you put these people in there for five days. But you can't take everybody from their job consistently, lean after lean after lean. I mean, they've got a job to do. So you have to kind of spread them out. Point Kaizen is the idea that as you see waste, you instantly make the change needed to fix it and remove it. But you need a mechanism to keep that through. And what Agile Service Management gave me was that mechanism. This was the methodology. I could put a backlog. We could put it into a sprint backlog. And we could lock in a time sprint with no changes allowed to make all these changes or improvements. So our backlog became our continuous improvement backlog. Hey, somebody, oh, this hurts. There's a defect here. There's a waste here. 
Let's put it in our backlog. Let's try to get it done in a sprint. Right? Very similar to Scrum. Um, it just has kind of a service management flavor, which I like. So there's still a process owner. You still have the team. The difference is you have an agile service manager, which is the Scrum counterpart. But this suddenly gave me a mechanism and a methodology to start making these changes fly through. So we had done a lot. We said, okay, it's the end of 2016. We finished that out. Let's go benchmark. It's been two years. How are we doing? Is all this making any improvement in the service desk? So we went out and benchmarked it. And that was the result. Average? Okay, that was the exact same reaction I had, and I did not notice that that said 2014. So initially, I was very disappointed and depressed. What I found out, we were actually there. We had moved from average to, in our class, the best in our class. And we were pumped about that. Pumped. And then my dad told me something that brought me down to earth. And he said, son, if you know the standard, why compare yourself to others? And what's the standard of lean? It's in the pursuit of perfection. So this is awesome. And we love this. But this is not the end. Because there's perfection out there that we're constantly pursuing with this mindset. So... Wrapping this all together, so you've kind of seen that whole journey, how we've wandered through this. Um, oh, good, we're doing good on time. How we wandered through this, took this position, learned about lean, started to apply it, said, okay, there's systems thinking I've got to look at. There's feedback I've got to be aware of. And honestly, with, service, with agile service management, we really gave ourselves the permission to experiment with ideas. We started hitting the three ways, if you read the Phoenix Project. We started hitting them strong. So... Systems thinking, TOC, theory of constraint, it tells you where to focus. Hey, this process really is painful. This is the one you need to focus on. Lean goes in and extracts that waste, that non-value-added activity out of that process, just drags it out. Agile service management gives you a vehicle to continuously improve and sustain it. So you don't lose all, oh, hey, this is a great idea. Let's put it on the backlog, run it through Sprint. Point Kaizen. And then KCS creates the best way I can describe it is the Borg hive mind in just a non-threatening way. <laughs> this is an IT conference, so I can use a Star Trek reference, right? Okay. Because with KCS, what one person learns, another person can know very rapidly. So that feedback loop, and it just kind of starts to tie it all together. Now, this journey was not without its ups and downs. And I learned a lot on the way <laughs> of things you want to avoid and pitfalls. So here are really the big four ones that I see. Organizational culture. Shocker, right? If a culture is resistant to change, it's going to be harder. But most cultures are, and you just got to start. We were very, very fortunate to have a president who started pushing this down. But I'll tell you, sometimes what gets pushed down from the top gets lost halfway in middle management, right? We all see this. So it's a top-down, bottom-up. So if you're attacking this, just have grit and determination and keep going after it. Try to get the top and then push from the bottom up. Skimping on your value stream. Oh, this bit is so many times. So skimping on your value stream looks like this. Okay, we got to do this lean. We know we should have Frank in here, but Frank's a jerk. <laughs> He's always negative, and we never want him around, so let's just not include him. But Frank may be the key piece to that value stream that you need in there. And we did that a few times where we skipped on the value stream, and we just shoved the problem down the road. Remember, we didn't get it at the constraint, so it was an illusion. So don't skip on your value stream. Go get those people that are intentionally resistant and make them be part of the solution. Because when Frank starts to go, well, I think this will work, everyone goes, well, if Frank says it will, it must be awesome. Okay? Don't skimp on your value stream. Technology gap. There is such a thing as a technology gap. Process and technology are becoming so interwoven, so intertwined, that you can't rip one away without the other. And so when you're trying to implement new processes, 
when you're trying to capitalize on these improvements from lean, you might run into technology that slows you down. The way we started talking about in our organization is we would say, if we can get this technology, we can reduce these these of the eight wastes. You know, we can reduce uh, process lead time. We can increase, you know, reduce cycle time. We started using the language of lean and saying this technology will enable us to improve this. It's not the end, but we need it to enable us. And passive executive support. <laughs> this is a fun one. So when we talked about a champion in the lean, you need active executive support. This is what passive executive support looks like. You're in a boardroom or you're presenting to some high-level execs. You say, hey, I want to do this. We want to do this. And you get the golf clap. You get some head nods. You might even get the guy in the back going, good job. But he's whispering, good job. Right? And then the first thing you run into, well, I didn't know that that was a great idea. Active executive support was when our executive stands up and said, by golly, we're doing this, and I'm supporting it, I'm the champion, and this is going to happen. So you know it when you get it. So be aware, get, get that active executive support as you go after these. So what do we have planned for in 2017? So I've told you about where we've been, what we've gone through, kind of the steps we went through. And I look back and I go, oh my goodness, we started this journey in 2011. 2017, we've, 16, we've done a lot, but I feel like there's still so much more to do. So 2017, we're implementing a new tool, Technology Gap, right? We've chosen ServiceNow. Um, we want to start taking service management beyond IT. Hey, facilities, you could use this. And guess what? You can be lean too. Lean Six Sigma. Okay, this is where the geek in me gets a little excited because Lean Six Sigma, if Lean's about extracting waste from a process, Six Sigma is about reducing variation in a process. And once you get to this state, you can really start applying those tools and making things more predictable. Predictable is good. And finally, DevOps. When you look at Lean, and this has been said here many times, when you look at Lean, when you look at dimming, when you look at all these efforts, it's leading to one place, and that's DevOps. That's DevOps. DevOps, in my opinion, is simply applying lean to software development and infrastructure. Flow, right? Feedback, experimentation, that's what it's doing. Now, my son, Silver Dollar City, the powder keg, I don't want to ride. So he went through the whole fun thing in the roller coaster, screaming and crying and laughing. And we get to the end, right? And it stops. And you hear the, the, they release, click, click, click. And you know what he said? I want to do that again. I want to do that again. It's like, all right, man, let's do it. And that is how I feel with this lean journey. It has been crazy. It's gone through twists and turns and times I've wanted to cry, times I've wanted to scream, but gosh, I want to do it again. And what I hope you can take away from this is the desire to learn more about this, maybe take away some practical things you can try now. You kind of have the blueprint of how to do a lean event. Go try it. It will be scary. You will say, I didn't want to do this, but at the end, you're going to say, I want to do that again. There we go, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys very much for your time. I appreciate you coming to the event. Um, if you have a moment, fill out the survey so we know how we did, so I know how I did. Feedback loop, right? Do it quick so that feedback loop is short. Lean. And with that, I think I have a few minutes for questions. Do I have any questions? No, oh, thank you guys. <laughs>